My name is Fanny Elahi. I'm a physician and a scientist, and I uh, work on neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, but not just exclusively Alzheimer's disease. Today's talk, however, will be about Alzheimer's disease, and therefore, that's really going to be the focus of the talk. Um, I am at the Mount Sinai um, ICANN School of Medicine, um, and I see patients half a day a week and do science in my lab the rest of the time. The reason why I do so much research is that we really ought to discover uh, therapies for these awful neurodegenerative disorders. All right, without further ado, I will dive right in. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease is a clinical diagnosis, but it is a clinical diagnosis with many different faces. And in fact, the very first case of Alzheimer's disease described by Lois Alzheimer's at the turn of the 20th century was not our typical Alzheimer's disease that starts in the 70s or 80s and ends uh, with dementia at a late life stage. This woman who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and has become the face of Alzheimer's disease actually had early onset dementia and had Alzheimer's pathology, but amongst other things, um, had a robust, um, fast progressive degenerative condition that took her life in her 50s, not 70s, not 80s. And then as, as a community, as a global community, we started studying Alzheimer's disease and discovered patterns of brain degeneration on imaging. That's showing you in a cartoon format in the middle. Um, that there are specific areas of the brain that get attacked early and prominently in Alzheimer's disease. What makes Alzheimer's disease a, a difficult disease to study is the many faces of it, clinically and pathologically. But what also makes it the best uh, disease to study are the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, meaning the fact that now we can detect and diagnose Alzheimer's disease before someone is in the phase of dementia while they are living. How we do that is based on two proteins that we measure on imaging through PET scans in cerebral spinal fluid and as I'll, sh I'll show you later on, in blood nowadays. One of the proteins is tau. It's what we think is the most toxic protein in the brain. It does its job, it's functional, are neurons needed? But when Alzheimer's disease starts, it starts malfunctioning. We don't know exactly why, but it starts mislocalizing, going to areas that it's not supposed to go, and undergoing conformational changes that we think are pathological. The other protein that accumulates in the brain, that Alzheimer's disease is defined uh, based on, on, on these two, is amyloid. What amyloid is, again, it's a totally normal protein. Our brain produces it. We still don't exactly understand its function, but there are some studies that suggest that we actually need it for memory formation. Now, that's pretty light um, uh, research because most of the research is looking at this protein as a pathological protein. What's pathological about amyloid is that it's not clearing from the brain. So as we start thinking about amyloid, it may be a marker of brain clearance. In of itself, it's not as toxic as tau, but its presence in the brain above a certain threshold is a sign of Alzheimer's disease. So if someone has these two proteins accumulating in their brain, they get the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, whether they have clinical deficits or not. What this means is pretty big. It means that we now, for the first time, have the chance to diagnose disease before there is significant impairment in someone's function. And that's exactly when we want to diagnose disease, because that's exactly when you would like to intervene on a disease process. So overall, we have two different categories of biomarkers. One is the molecular biomarkers, and these so far have been pr prominently tau, the, pro the first protein I talked about, and amyloid. But really, the um, 
our uh, toolkit for molecular biomarkers is rapidly expanding and providing new opportunities for understanding the different aspects and the different phases of disease, and I'll show you some uh, data on that. The other kind of biomarker is imaging. That's when a picture of the brain is taken, either by MRI, that's static. What MRI shows is where the brain tissue has been lost, or we can actually do molecular scans, and you may have heard about amyloid PET scans or tau PET scans, which basically show on an imaging where these two proteins, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, accumulate. Ultimately, what we really want to do, and we think this is within reach, I can't give it a date, but it's within reach, is to cure Alzheimer's disease or I'm going to be a little bit more conservative, to cure dementia. Maybe we're not going to get rid of Alzheimer's disease. Maybe if our brain ages to a certain date, we're going to accumulate these proteins. But we think we can stop someone from progressing to dementia. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the different therapeutic angles that we are uh, considering and, and working on as a community. What's really critical, though, is that we diagnose Alzheimer's disease and other dementias based on buckets. We have criteria, there's memory impairment, there's executive dysfunction, processing speed, you know, how, how fast someone thinks declines, there are changes in judgment, there are changes in empathy, sense of connectedness. There are all sorts of changes. There are changes to behavior. It's not just memory. So there, there are a slew of changes that occur in someone who is declining and ultimately reaches the stage of dementia. These are buckets. When someone's, you know, we have metrics, we have tests that we administer to someone, but it's pretty artificial. The reality of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is that it's on a continuum. Someone's function is declining on a daily basis. And in fact, it doesn't just decline, it does this. There are better days and there are worse days. And so our ways of diagnosing and bucketing people in these diagnostic buckets is artificial, and that's not very productive. Uh, so alongside of developing better biomarkers for early diagnosis, we are also developing better ways of measuring decline and impairment. The other thing to consider is that if someone's memory has always been terrible, a memory impairment may not be a sign of Alzheimer's disease. It may just be a sign of brain aging. Their brain is aging and now their bad memory is worse. So when I see someone in clinic, um, I think for the first 15 minutes, people are puzzled because I asked about their childhood. I asked about how they were in high school, what they did as a young adult, what they liked, what they didn't like, and I always need someone by the patient's side who's known them. Because disease and impairment is about change. It's not about a line that we draw in someone's life. And so mood, sleep, movement, perception, connections, and cognition are all part of this change. And in a given individual, some of these may change and some of them may not. And ultimately, what we really want for therapeutics, and me as a molecular neuroscientist really want, are the molecules that are linked with these clinical changes or these experiential changes. And so the combination of these two give us confidence that the changes in an individual are due to disease process, as opposed to a difficult phase in their life or psychiatric abnormalities that many of us can experience in life. Why I'm very optimistic about the future is that thus far in our clinical um, setting and our diagnostic approaches, we have been limited to these buckets. We've been limited to medical records, to classical tests that put someone in the normal or abnormal category, animal models that I frankly personally don't think are reflecting the complexity of disease that we ought to capture, and some lab tests that have been extremely limited. When you see someone in clinic, the, the tools that we have are at our disposal are extremely limited. 
And so some of the things that we do is that we bring someone in research because we can do a lot more in research than we can at the moment in clinic and, and allow us to understand disease uh, under a totally different angle. Why this is a turning point for research in Alzheimer's disease is that now we have molecules that we can detect in blood. We don't even need an imaging or quote unquote an inv invasive process such as lumbar puncture to get cerebrospinal fluid. We can cap take blood like anyone would to do lipid tests or look at the sugar levels or inflammation levels. And at this point now look at Alzheimer's disease and not just Alzheimer's disease, but thousands of molecules that then we apply advanced analytical methods to, to understand what is the dysregulated biology. And I'll show you a little bit uh, about what we do with that. Then as you may have heard about machine learning and artificial intelligence analytical methods, we're using them to study Alzheimer's disease. We're detecting not this much, but this much data. And instead of doing simple statistical tests to test one, two, three hypotheses, we're asking the data to point us to where the abnormalities are. And finally, applying these novel advanced uh, analytical methods, we're asking the data to show us how people cluster. Instead of giving the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia or Parkinson's disease, we're asking the data to tell us what similarities and differences people have. And I would say bucket, but bucket biologically, as opposed to a very limited set of factors that we measure um, and we categorize people by. So in summary, we're linking genes um, to molecules and I would say exposures, environmental exposures, to understand how pathology begins, how it develops, and where people end. And, and we want to do this as early as possible because to win our fight against Alzheimer's disease, we need to intervene early. So we started by having Parkinson's disease as a distinct category, Alzheimer's disease as another distinct category, and another disease which you may have heard about because uh, there are um, famous people now being diagnosed with this, frontotemporal dementia. We had a frontotemporal dementia uh, bucket. And within each of these buckets, we did a little bit better than just a large bucket. We had sub-buckets, but they're still buckets. Now that we are capturing this rich data, we are seeing overlap between these. And not only overlap between neurodegenerative disease categories, but with other diseases. And what this opens up is very exciting. It opens up the possibility of drug repurposing. So not only we're working actively, on discovering new molecules and therapeutic interventions, but we get to see what is abnormal about someone and whether they could benefit from a drug that we're using for diabetes, for a drug that we're using for an autoimmune condition, for a drug that we're using for something like multiple sclerosis. And so a summary of what I've said so far is that we have thus far advanced quite a bit by just being able to capture the tip of an iceberg of disease. And now, over the past decade, we have new tools that allow us to take a look at what's underneath the water. We are looking at disease on a continuum. We are measuring not only function, and, and by function, it's not just cognition, we're measuring behavior, we're measuring movement, we're looking at sleep. Uh, we're, we're looking at activity during daytime that someone has. Soon, we're going to be looking at behavior on a totally different level by looking at usage of, some, of someone's phone, and this has already started um, happening. And, and, I, and I think once we capture this really rich data set, we're going to start detecting disease at its very earliest stage. So now on to... Um, are approved drugs, the FDA approved drugs, which we don't think are game changers, but we're very excited about because these drugs are marking a new era um, of research in Alzheimer's disease. We're going from an observational, descriptive 
research to interventional. It's opened up basically uh, the door to interventions. So you heard about amyloid, one of the proteins that accumulates in the brain, and this is the, the target for, um, for the drugs that have been FDA approved. I'm showing you data from lecanemab uh, developed by ESI, uh, but there's aducanemab that you also heard about and many other anti-amyloid therapeutics that are in the pipeline. What these drugs are doing very effectively is to get rid of amyloid from the brain. And so the figure on the left is showing you the difference um, in blue is individuals who got placebo, and in uh, orange are individuals who got drug. Their, their brain is free of amyloid. Basically, after 18 months, you have undetectable levels of amyloid in the brain. The figure in the middle is showing you function. Their function improved a bit. Now, is that significant? I would say so. They didn't decline more rapidly and it slowed progression. And in the face of having nothing or having something, it's promising and encouraging. And this is why we have been enthusiastic about this. Now, it does come with side effects. So I don't think everyone can get this drug. And it's always a question of benefit or risk, right? Does that amount of uh, slowing in decline outweigh the risk of having side effects. So these are not perfect drugs for that reason. But what's really encouraging is that we only went for the tip of the iceberg and we hit function. This is really promising. Can you imagine that if we actually did not go for just one problem, we went early and we went for what causes amyloid to accumulate in the brain, as opposed to the end point of amyloid accumulating in the brain, how much function we could save. And that's how we in the research field are thinking about these uh, drugs and the effect that they've had. This is complicated, but I'll walk you through it because it's very exciting. So not only we're measuring disease and we're going after pathology, but we're also discovering resilience. This is very exciting. This means that there are individuals out there who have both amyloid and tau in the brain. And not only just that, but I'm showing you data on an individual who had amyloid and tau and a gene that predisposed this person to developing Alzheimer's disease with almost full certainty. This is uh, Priscillin 1, and it's, it's a cause of familial inherited Alzheimer's disease. Individuals with mutations in this gene have Alzheimer's disease, give or take, 10 years from the time that their parents got Alzheimer's disease. So there are families that have basically Alzheimer's disease inher um, inherited uh, from uh, generation to generation. It's rare, it's about 600, 700 people in the world that we've identified with these kinds of mutation. But this, this um, individual, this woman, had a personal in one mutation, and everyone in her family that carried this mutation got Alzheimer's disease around the age of 50. She was in her 70s functioning independently and was brought in to be studied. Uh, her brain was full of amyloid. She had some tau, that very toxic protein that I talked about. She had atrophy, that's the gray image that I'm showing you. She had brain volume loss, and abnormalities of the white matter. So for all intents and purposes, from a biomarker perspective, she had Alzheimer's disease. And remember, she had a genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease, so she was supposed to develop Alzheimer's disease and decline and dementia, but she did not have dementia. When the team looked at metabolism in her brain, her metabolism, and that's the blue circle, was completely normal. So. On the left are individuals with Alzheimer's disease, and on the right are individuals that, who, are, who don't have Alzheimer's disease and are cognitively normal. So the amount of metabolism in her brain, or the, or the meta metabolic function of her brain, was that of a normal person without Alzheimer's disease. So how we think of this person and others in this case is that they are resilient to pathology. Their brain is able to function despite having pre been predisposed to developing Alzheimer's disease and showing the hallmarks of disease. And now on the right, I'm showing you data from, Mount, from ICANN School of Medicine, Mount Sinai, in our research project for Alzheimer's disease. We measure now these uh, molecules, not in cerebral spinal fluid or imaging, but in blood. 
So we have individuals with Alzheimer's disease on the right in red, and individuals that we categorize as control. These are individuals who are functioning normally, their PET scans are normal, or their cerebrospinal fluids are normal, and we measure these proteins in their blood. So the blue circle shows you individuals who have levels that are congruent with having Alzheimer's disease, but they're functioning completely normally. We cannot detect any abnormal or decline in their cognitive function. So now that we're able to detect these molecules in blood, we are able to detect resilience at a completely different scale. We don't even need a gene, uh, which is rare, a genetic mutation, which is rare. We just need to measure pathology and then look at function. And when you get a dissociation, it's telling you that there are biological factors in this individual that is giving them the, the possibility to resist disease. And we think this is as much a promising avenue for drug development as, as getting rid of, the, uh, rid of pathology from the brain. And now on to our new tools. So uh, the data that I showed you in blood of Alzheimer's disease is now done at scale, automatically measured uh, with at hypersensitive uh, levels um, in blood through equipment that we and others have. But we're not stopping there. We want to measure thousands of molecules because disease is not about one thing as much as function is not about one thing. So what we really want to detect are what I call dysregulations in the molecular networks that sustain function. And how we do that is by measuring over 7,000 proteins, and now we're measuring over 7,000 metabolites and combining this rich data set to point to abnormalities that are upstream of the amyloid and tau. I'll run you through this slide because it's very exciting. So if you take cerebral spinal fluid, that's the image on the left, or blood on the right, and measure these over 7,000 proteins in someone's biofluids, apply machine learning and artificial intelligence um, analytical methods, you get to cluster individuals in categories just by looking at their molecules. This is giving our algorithms no other data, no cognitive data, no functional data. I'm not even telling it uh, whether they have the degree of amyloid or tau that they have. I'm just saying, can you separate individuals that have Alzheimer's disease from those that don't? And you may have heard about APOE4, which is a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't predispose an individual, but it's a risk factor. We also gave it that, and, I, uh, and we asked whether, uh, the, whether we can separate individuals that have Alzheimer's disease with APOE4 from individuals who have Alzheimer's disease without APOE4. And we were able to do that in the cerebrospinal fluid with great precision. Now, not everyone gives us cerebrospinal fluid, and it's somewhat invasive. Can we do that in blood? And the answer is that yes. Not as neatly as we could in cerebrospinal fluid. That's a fluid that's closest to the brain. But we can do it in blood to a certain extent, and I would say it's good enough. It's good enough to do it, to allow us to do it at scale and start looking at um, population level data. The other emerging tool in the toolkit that we and others are doing is the concept of function, the functional decline that I pointed to. That really bothers me as a clinician. When I see a patient in clinic, their story is so much richer than the cognitive testing that they do. They're also nervous. It's not fun to do cognitive testing when you're being tested for your memory. Also, we may be asking people to do things they haven't done for decades. I ask them to draw 3D shapes. Someone may do that for fun or be, have been really good at it, and someone may have been terrible at it. So now what we're doing is we're um, capturing videos. And what we're looking at is not how someone can recall a set of words or solve a problem on a pen and paper test, but we want to see their facial features, how they react emotionally to an image, to a story, how their face moves, the intonation in their voice, the pace of their speech, their eye movement. All of these are measures of function and abnormality that we think we can detect at a much more sensitive 
level and potentially continuously. So we're able to capture videos when someone is in the comfort of their home as opposed to sitting in an exam room being tested directly about their function. Another very exciting component of our detection tool is movement. So cognition is not the only thing that changes. In fact, if you measure the pace of gait, how fast someone walks, it, you, can, you can predict uh, risk of developing dementia in the decade that is uh, to follow. So what we're doing is to give wearables, you know, this is a small watch-like device that people put around their wrist, around their foot, or even smaller sensors that we can put underneath their feet and measure their movement. This is looking at two groups, so totally normal individuals and individuals at risk of developing um, Parkinson's disease based on REM behavior disorder. It's an abnormality during someone's sleep. It's basically when someone acts out their dreams. That's a phase of sleep in which we're paralyzed. Um, and individuals who have REM behavior disorder are not paralyzed during that phase and they get to move. So, Looking at individuals um, that have REM behavior disorder or not, we, we can detect that based on wearables uh, on a 24-hour cycle. On the left, we're, I'm showing you group-level data, and on the right, it's each individual tracing. So there are outliers even there. You have blue lines that are within the red lines and vice versa. And again, this is not noise, this is reality because each component of function that's abnormal in of itself does not suffice. It's many different things that we need to measure and for them to give a coherent story of impairment. The other place where we're looking is the retina. It's the light penetrating extension of the brain. We're looking at blood vessels in the retina. We're looking at the thinning of the different layers of the retina. It's non-invasive, it's rapid, it's easy for individuals to do it. And if we can detect abnormalities in the retina, once we have therapies, we get to measure their efficacy in the retina potentially. And this is being done for multiple sclerosis. Now we're applying it to brain aging and degenerative diseases. Ultimately, what we want to do is to combine our molecular measurements with imaging, brain, retina, any kind of imaging that is non-invasive and tolerable. And what, what we categorize as quantitative phenotypes. So these are all the different kinds of measures that I mentioned to you the voice, the movement, the facial features, in addition to cognitive testing, and apply advanced analytical methods to subgroup individuals. Because as I'll show you in the next slide, there's not one bucket of disease, but there's also not one bucket of Alzheimer's disease. Within the bucket of Alzheimer's disease, there are many different kinds of disease. So it's not going to be one drug fix all. This is going to be for sure, the case. But so far, all that we were measuring is what everyone has in common, tau and amyloid. So that does not suffice to allow us to delineate these different buckets. But with our new tools, we are doing this in research. Now, it takes a little bit of time to go from research to clinic because it's a big deal to give someone a diagnosis. So you need to be pretty damn sure that your measurement of abnormality is actually a good measurement of abnormality. This is why there's a delay. Uh, first, do no harm. So we do this in research. Once we're definitely sure that we're, we're detecting something real and that we can act upon it, we take it into clinic. At Mount Sinai, we try to accelerate this as much as possible because we realize the gap between the tools that we have in clinic and what we're able to do in research. We've had a very productive decade, and I'm as excited as I can ever be as a physician scientist. It gives me great hope, and I try to convey that to my patients in clinic. I really do think we're gonna have impactful treatments in the next decade that's gonna follow. The start was with the anti-amyloids, but that's just the start. We're gonna have treatments that are gonna have lower toxicity and greater impact. And we're gonna do that by being able to target precisely what we need to target.
So we're going to use these continuous quantitative traits or phenotypes. We're going to combine them with molecular biomarkers of abnormality in order to be able to detect early and intervene with great precision. How we're doing that in research is that we're really focused on the individual and on humans, as we should be. I personally, my bias is that I don't use animal models because I think it's, we need to use the tools that we have now to detect in humans. Animal models have a role. Once you detect in humans and you want to understand the mechanism you take in into model systems, but the detection really ought to be in humans. One of the reasons why we've put billions of dollars and have gone after amyloid is that we developed a mouse model of amyloidopathy. And that was great, because then we could get rid of amyloid and show all the mechanisms in model systems. And then we took that into humans, and it was not a total failure. We had a little bit of an effect, but it was not hitting disease as, as strongly as we needed to hit it, because it was not the disease. It was a model that we had developed and that we had cured. So that's why I really think that the start needs to be in humans. And then we take it into model systems. The other very, very exciting tool that we now have is that we don't need to just go to animal models. We build dish models from humans. We now take human cells, we turn them into stem cells, then we make brain cells from those. We combine them into mini brains, and we study mechanisms in human dish models. We, all, we get to study the interaction of the cells, the accumulation of abnormal protein, and then we get to do drug screening safely in a dish before we actually take it into human beings. And this is what really turned the page for cancer therapeutics. And this is why the page is getting turned for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Ultimately, this is what I've been talking about. We detect early, and we now can detect early, just by looking at the tip of the iceberg. Looping all the way back to what I started, Alzheimer's disease is a terrible disease to study because it's not one disease. Once we recognize that it's not just one disease, then we're good. We can proceed with our toolkit. But it is also the best spectrum of disorders to study because we have amyloid and tau that we can measure in blood. So we get to say someone is at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, we can't do that for Parkinson's disease or frontotemporal dementia or for any number of diseases where we don't have the ability to detect the tip of the iceberg yet. So once we detect abnormality, say routinely at someone's annual checkup, the levels are a little bit elevated. Does it mean that they have disease? Because it's not a bucket. This is a continuum, and as I showed you, the dots are falling all over the map. There's great amount of overlap between people without disease and control. But it basically says that you're at risk. There's something that you need to change about your lifestyle. Uh, you, you do need to exercise more, sleep better, decrease stress. You know, It may be a number of factors that each individual needs to do. Not too dissimilar to what your cardiologist would do with your lipids um, or your endocrinologist would do with your blood sugar. It just allows us to detect abnormality early. Then we can use the larger toolkit that we've developed and subtype disease. So instead of saying, here's that large bucket of Alzheimer's disease, good luck, we get to add new molecules and say, you have Alzheimer's disease, and we detect metabolic abnormalities. You have Alzheimer's disease, and we think lipids may be contributing to your Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. And then we do drug repurposing. This, this would be our chance of saying, you should take this, this, this at that dose, and then measure these uh, biomarkers again to make sure that the levels are now within the safe uh, range. The other pipeline, even more ambitious, is to combine genetics. Ultimately, disease is, is the expression of our genes as we live through our environment. So now, similar to the molecules that I showed you, we don't take one gene anymore. We have polygenic risk scores. We take a person's genome and we build risk scores based on someone's entire genome, not just one gene or two genes. Combine that with the environmental risk factors that we know of, and then do the same pipeline. So this is 
before you even detect Alzheimer's disease. And how we're going to really, really um, win the battle against um, awful neurodegenerative diseases is to think not just about pathology, but also about resilience. Um, if we are able to uncover biology for resilience against neurodegenerative diseases, then we get to fight against Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and Alzheimer's disease maybe all, all at once. Maybe the factors for resilience are not disease specific, but there are specific pathways that allow the neurons and the glia, the cells in the brain, to resist the pathology. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. who's had memory problems for 10 years. Um, is there a current drug on the market today that would uh, be helpful? Very good question and a very tough question. Um, so there are two uh, currently FDA approved drugs. Lacanumab is the most recent one with a slightly better maybe uh, side effect to effect profile. Uh, we and others are still uh, thinking about the best and safest way to administer this drug and, and also thinking about who would benefit from this drug. Unfortunately, in the clinical trials, there wasn't enough precision. It was Alzheimer's disease versus no Alzheimer's disease. And so I think uh, the only drugs right now are these two, and, and the clinician would need to take a lot more factors into account in order to be able to advise whether um, um, the 86-year-old woman would benefit from the drug or not. There are symptomatic drugs, however, and one of them was discovered at Mount Sinai, um, galantamine, and so these are uh, drugs that basically help slow down the decline, the symptomatic decline, improve memory and function by boosting uh, the levels of a molecule, acetylcholine, in the brain. And, and those have been used very well in clinic. And I, I give that to anyone that I diagnose with Alzheimer's disease. Pleasure. Hi. Um, if I can have you talk about resilience and resistance and the diseases you mentioned, heart disease, uh, what is the paradox of cancer and dementia telling us? Is, oh, wow. Is it environmental? Is it genetic? Is it immunologic? You, um, I'll stop there. And... Yeah, so you mean the paradox, more neurodegenerative diseases, less cancer, and vice versa? Um, it's, it's a very good question, and I think we and others are trying to understand that. Um, it may be both. I mean, for me, it's always both. There's a genetic component, but there's also an environmental component. You know, there are, there are incredible stories of early onset Alzheimer's disease in families without genetic causes and cancer um, in, in families without genetic causes. And so there's definitely the environmental component that we don't understand very well. Um, but it definitely is not a survival bias, which we used to think for a long time, right? So I, I think the jury's still out on how we can leverage this um, in our understanding of resilience. But I would say that some of the factors that we understand for resilience are baseline factors of, of someone's behavior, uh, maybe a, even a bit of personality, um, but also things like exercise and diet. Um, and social interactions, you know, uh, the, the sense of connectedness and, and brain activity. And the brain activity is not just cognitive activity. It, this is why social interaction is, is so important. It's basically um, having the brain react to, the, to a rich environment. Um, one of the things actually about uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is very sad and um, uh, difficult um, as a clinician, is that when someone gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, uh, environment reacts to that person slightly differently. And we think that may actually be part of the decline that can be more, a little bit more rapid uh, post-diagnosis. So I take pause in actually giving a diagnosis, and I try to do it as carefully as I can and, and, and try to convey that 
we are all living on a spectrum. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an artificial line that we're drawing. And some people are living with Alzheimer's disease without ever getting diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So environment, interaction, social interaction, exercise, sleep, and I'm going to say decreasing stress as much as one can. Um, but despite this, there's biology that we need to uncover because there are people who smoke, who don't exercise, who don't eat healthy, and don't develop dementia. So. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful session. What's your opinion of the drugs that are advertised on the market for memory uh, prevention? Oh, you mean the non-FDA approved drugs over the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, actually. And I think I like how rigorous we are with drug approvals because it takes exactly that. You know, there's a huge placebo effect. Um, and therefore, we need to do... Um, we need to apply our methods for approval of drugs, which is double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, in order to be really sure that something, that molecule, is, is actually having an effect. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anyone that you want to choose. <laughs> C congratulations on a wonderful presentation Thanks. and exciting work. I'm so happy to hear this stuff going on. Um, Someone sent me an article by uh, an Israeli professor, I think his name was Ifrati, talking about the use of hyperbaric oxygen to help or slow down dementia. Is it science or is it still speculative right now? It's still speculative right now and it has some risk when you expose the brain to, to such levels. Um, I would say that it's based on the understanding that blood flow to the brain changes. And oxygenation, the, the ability of the brain to extract oxygen from the blood that is being delivered is altered uh, in aging and, and neurodegenerative diseases. But I, I don't think that um, we have evidence that the fix to that problem is actually hyperbaric chambers. So it sounds like from your presentation, testing's way ahead of treatment. Yeah. So I'm 67. When do you get tested in the absence of symptoms? Very good question. It depends on your philosophy in life. Whether <laughs> you would do well with, uh, you know, abnormalities that don't have, say, an impactful drug, but that you would be comfortable with that information and then change of lifestyle and other things that you want to do. Um, or whether it would be demoralizing and depressive and, and, you know, have a negative impact. I think it really comes down to that. And um, I get this often that why test when you don't have a treatment, but this is how we developed really great drugs for cardiovascular disease and this is how we have great drugs for cancer. So the, the diagnosis is really the beginning of the treatment. So following on, on the, that a little bit, what can you explain a little bit more what the screening would be if someone is interested in screening, if they have some family risk and so forth? Yeah. The screening, um, so, so there are two different things, you know, there's research um, and, and there's clinic. And in clinic, currently what we can do is uh, lumbar punctures and cerebral spinal fluid testing. The reason why we do that is that um, the blood tests are actually, I think, a little bit more sensitive to a certain extent, and, and we don't have cutoffs yet. Um, so, you know, I can say that someone actually has Alzheimer's disease if the levels are, ac are actually elevated, whereas we started looking at cerebral spinal fluid in the 80s. And so by now, we know exactly what the risk threshold actually is. The other thing that we can do are PET scans, but that's very expensive for most people out of pocket. And I think one good thing that came out of these treatments is that now insurance may start paying for those PET scans, which are not going to be lumbar puncture dependent. So it would, it would entail seeing a clinician in clinic, uh, a, a behavioral specialist like me, a, a dementia specialist like me, and then starting a workup. And what I do is I really look at everything. I look at um, lipids. I look at blood sugars. Um, I look at inflammation levels. I take an MRI. I look at function. I get a story. And then based on that, 
we move forward with um, these tests that can add, I would say, N of one, that individual give us a diagnosis. And then if they're interested in research, there's a lot more that can be done in research. But research at this point is more about contributing to advancing knowledge as opposed to getting information back that can help that one individual understand where they actually stand. There's also genetic testing, but you know, APOE4 is really what we do clinically. Hi, thank you, fabulous. Um, I'm curious whether you're seeing any correlation between phenotype presentation of symptoms and previous history of virus exposure or infections. Oh, yeah. Um, that's an exciting area of research because um, I think that one million dollar Million is not a lot of money these days. Um, the high impact question is why does someone develop a neurodegenerative disease at the point that they develop a neurodegenerative disease? And why we have been unable to answer this question is that we studied people with disease. So that's an impossible question to answer. But now that we can detect very early abnormalities, we're gonna be able to tackle these questions. On um, brain, tissue analysis. There are some viruses that are seen at higher prevalence, but those viruses are very prevalent, and some people with those viruses are not developing the disease. My personal opinion is that it's about the immune response that someone mounts to anything, including a virus. And some of the most exciting areas of research are actually immunotherapies, I think, in the future. They say it's important to work as long as you can for your uh, cognitive uh, function, but how do you connect the effects of working long, which also has a side effect of stress? Yes, yes. <laughs> you didn't hear that. <laughs> Very popular question. Um, so I agree if someone stopped to working and then sat in front of the TV, probably not good. But if someone stopped working and had a richer life, great. So I think it really comes down to how uh, simplified or depleted you know, um, the life becomes after working. It really comes down to that. And that's why I, many of my patients ask how many languages they need to learn once they get a diagnosis, you know, or should they do Sudoku? Uh, and my answer is always like, if you enjoy, Doing it, yes, do it. It's more about the experience, and actually the emotional component is important. But yeah. What about stress too? So stress has a bell-shaped curve, and we've known that uh, for a long time. So a little bit of stress is probably not bad, but too much stress backfires. And it, it has a very nice biology that has been worked out that it, it's detrimental to function throughout the body, not just the brain, other organs as well. You said that right now they've detected, you've detected 30 substrates of this disorder. If you gave this presentation five years from now, would, if you gave this presentation five years from now, would we see 60 substrates? Hmm. Um, so not exactly 30, but I would say there are these tip of the icebergs, right? And, and maybe by substrates you mean different kinds of abnormalities. Um, what we're doing on the molecular side is combining the abnormalities and, and understanding what pathways or what molecular networks are actually dysfunction and connect that to cellular function. Um, and then understanding that, I would say more than distinct abnormalities, movement is related to brain function as much as cognition or emotions are related to brain function. So different ways of detecting brain function. And at the end, it's the same organ and, and overlapping brain networks that are, are, that are going awry. And I think the game is about what's the earliest and yet most certain abnormality that we can detect. And my sleep colleagues are gonna say it's sleep. Just Look at the eight hours someone spends sleeping and you can say who's gonna develop dementia. Um, someone else is gonna say it's movement and I'm gonna say it's facial features or voice. And so we're testing all of these uh, together. And because there are so many different buckets, it may be that 
Um, there are going to be different kinds of abnormalities that we're going to detect in different individuals. But what we want to do is to make it very simple. So one thing that we're doing is we're just having someone say a few sentences every day. Um, and I and over the years, see whether we're detecting decline in their voice, for instance, and whether that's actually predictive. Um, we, you want to be non-invasive, and you want to be uh, not intruding in someone's life. I think that's a really important factor. What would you do if someone gave you $10 million tomorrow? <laughs> I would measure uh, the 7,000 plus molecules that we can in, in thousands of samples that we have. So one of the things that Mount Sinai has done, uh, one of the many visionary things that Mount Sinai has done is to create what we call a real world cohort of 60,000 individuals in the health system and collect blood from them and clinical data just you know routinely in their clinical care. And these samples have been banked. They're just sitting there. Um, and so we... You know, one of the problems in research is that we look at people who are willing to come to research and who may have impairment, et cetera, but we're not looking at the population. So this is a population-based cohort that Mount Sinai has, and so we're able to measure these molecules, and I think we really ought to, because they're going to allow us to see um, what are abnormal early. That's what I would do with that money. <laughs> Malamide and galantamine already, uh, should they add Prevagen, or would they be just as well off not taking anything? <laughs> we'll have that conversation offline. Uh, <laughs> I would say they should add exercise. Type 2 diabetes is very common, and it was one of your overlaps for potassium, the, having a risk for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Tell us what you think is the pathology that is behind diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, and whether you think effective treatment with anti-diabetics, you know, is going to make a difference, or that's just a gene that is going to produce Alzheimer's disease inevitably. Very, very good question. One of the things that's emerging in Alzheimer's disease is the fact that the brain's ability to metabolize energy and function, the powerhouse of the cells, mitochondria, are becoming dysfunctional. And there are many different ways and many different hypotheses. And um, I like to think simply because I think too complex doesn't get us to therapies. And so one of the things that happens with mitochondria is oxidation. So, um, and this may be why, you know, the oxidative stress um, hypothesis has lived for so long. So, and maybe why exercise and, and other kinds of interventions have had effect. So I would say that may be what they actually have in common. Another uh, thread that may, may also be contributing is the role of the immune function in both of these diseases. Type 2 diabetes has a huge immune component. It's not just type 1 diabetes as we used to think, and so does Alzheimer's disease. And so why the metabolic function declines um, is, is one qu question and what we can do about that. But the other component is that immune cells are very metabolic cells. So it's possible that the metabolic function declines early in both and causes immune dysfunction that basically gives rise to both end pathologies. Um, targeting metabolism and targeting the immune system I think are going to be extremely promising for this exact reason. Time is up. Happy to talk offline. Thank you.